Welcome to After Office Hours. I'm your host, Michael Lucchese, and on with me today is Professor of History, Dr. Bradley Berzer. Dr. Berzer, it's great to have you. So today, we're going to talk about the idea of nationalism, which has sort of dominated a lot of contemporary political sure. discussions. Um, so first of all, I think my first question is, is America a nation? Um, or perhaps before that even, what is a nation? Yeah, well, a nation's hard to define, of course. And in the Old Testament, nations generally meant tribes. In our era, nations typically mean nation states, not quite a tribe, something that's much broader than that, usually protected by a centralized military funded by some kind of centralized bureaucracy, and then an educational system to make sure that children grow up as good citizens. So the, the nation has become the dominant form of political manifestation really the primary institution over the last about 500 years, but it's taken a bit to develop in terms of a nation state. Nationalism, though, is something a little bit different from nation and nation state. So my feeling is when we were founded as a republic, we were very much a republic, and I don't think it really lends itself towards nationhood. But after the Civil War, really during the Civil War, there's no doubt that we nationalized in a number of different ways. But that was a slow process. It's still in process, I think. The problem is so many of our modern nationalists, and it's, they can be both left and right, I think our right-wing nationalists tend to think of America triumphant, and our left-wing nationalists tend to think of America repentant. But they both have a similar narrative, uh, and that, I think, is, is interesting and dangerous and fascinating mm -hmm. at a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. But I think the struggle between kind of a nation as a centralized whole and a republic of a variety of different communities working together has been a constant struggle and tension in the American experience. So when, when the country was founded, um, you have a number of political documents that came out that sure. constitute the founding. Yeah. Um, from the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution, right. um, the Articles of Confederation before that, do you think that there is a sense of nationalism in any of those documents, or do you think that the idea of republicanism was dominant in all of these? And, and what, what right. does that mean um, when we're interpreting those documents? Yeah, if it was a nationalism at the time of the founding, it was an extremely mild nationalism. It wasn't the kind of nationalism that we'll see develop under Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson or any of the progressives. They can take some of the same language, and certainly Teddy Roosevelt in the new nationalism speech at Osawatomie in Kansas in 1910, his new nationalism speech, just it has all the language of the founding, but it takes it in, I think, like so many errors in the modern world, it takes a truth and exaggerates it. So the founding era, you find people like George Washington talking in terms of a nation, people like Alexander Hamilton, but others like Thomas Jefferson was pretty reluctant to do so, not completely. Uh, others though, James Madison is reluctant to call it a nation. But at the time, nation really meant kind of a coherent group of people, different again than a nation state or nationalism in the modern sense. And even Washington, who was probably the most nationalist among the founders along with Hamilton, even when he talked about the nation, he often used synonymously the word country, capital C, which has a lot more in common with the kind of Augustinian notion of a city of God or Cicero's cosmopolis, basically a, a country of goodwill, a country of all women and men of goodwill, who you know, from Adam to the last person, it's, it's much more of a transcendent kind of thing, I think. Oftentimes when conservatives talk about the concept of nationalism, they bring up the idea of um, the Declaration of Independence assertion that all men are created equal, mm -hmm. and, and America as a propositional nation. Do sure. you think that it, the concept of a propositional nation is even one that is coherent? Do you think that America is a propositional nation? Mm -hmm. Where does that idea come from? Yeah, I have no problem with that. The idea that somehow we're brought together in this proposition I think is fine. I, I don't have any... I, I think it would be hard to argue anything about America without including the Declaration of Natural Rights. I think that's just, I think it's essential to in what we are. I think we could have extremes. Maybe there's someone who thinks it's absolutely critical to every aspect of America. Someone else might say, well, it's certainly a part of the founding and therefore it plays a role throughout history. But I think it would be pretty hard to define the American people without some kind of reference to the Declaration and its propositions. And I think in part though, and, and let me put it this way, Michael, I think that 
you know, as much as we look at the Declaration, we have to be careful when we look at it because the first fifth is very different from the last four fifths. So the first fifth it are those propositions. You know, the idea that all men are created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. That's the philosophical part, which is gorgeous, absolutely. But 80% of that document is a reassertion of common law. And so if we look at the idea of common law, going back to Alfred and even to the pre-Christian pagans among the Anglo-Saxons and the Scandinavians and Northern Germanic peoples, common law really in so many ways went directly against the concept of a centralized nation because the common law can only arise from the commons, from the people. And it means that the common law in Hillsdale may develop slightly differently than it does in Jonesville or it does in Homer and or Adrian or any of these places and the same thing was true in England. London town was separate from London. Oxfordshire was separate from Oxford. And they each had common law, but those common laws were very much from the bottom up as opposed to a nation state, which is from the top down. And I think in that sense, as much as we want to suggest the Declaration is propositional, it's also a reaffirmation of so much of the English tradition of common law, too. Uh, you, earlier, you talked about um, America nationalizing during the Civil War and still in the process of nationalization. Right. Um, at, at the time of the Civil War, there were a number of wars for national unity in Europe. Sure. Uh, Germany, Italy, Absolutely. foremost among Garibaldi, them. Garibaldi, um, Bismarck, yeah. Do you think that there are certain parallels between them, uh, the German and Italian wars for unification mm -hmm. in the American Civil War? And how do you think that uh, has played out in American history from 1865 until today? Yeah, let me, if you don't mind, I'll answer it in a broad perspective for a moment. And that is, if we look at the history of nation states, there had always been a tendency among European Germanic tribes to tribalize and to focus on the tribe against all other things. And one of the earliest examples of the Christian church in the West trying to deal with politics was trying to restrain that latent nationalism that was there. And you really don't see the development of any kind of modern nationalism until roughly the 1400s when the Portuguese break from Islam. And rather than banding with all of Iberia, they kind of go their own way. We wouldn't call it a nation yet, but they definitely break away from the larger ethos of Christendom. And then of course, by the time you get to Luther, 500 years ago this year, by the time you get to Luther, you've already got nations kind of rising, but once you have the breakup of Christendom, then you see really an explosion of nationalisms, and that will continue. So over the last five to six hundred years, we've seen nation states trying to arise. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail, sometimes they grow very slowly. But as I had mentioned earlier, it really takes three components. It has to have, you have to have a military, you have to have an educational system to kind of teach people what it means to be a citizen as opposed to a liberal education, which is to be a citizen of the world. So now we have a political education or a civic education. And the third thing you have to have is a tax base. You have to have a bureaucracy that can be, that can say, okay, this year we'll raise this much in taxes, next year this much, 10 years from now this much. Otherwise you can't plan anything out. And a major problem of the Middle Ages, not just the church trying to stop nationalism and keeping a universalism, but you had no mechanism by which to have a permanent military or a permanent education or a permanent bureaucracy. So in part, there's no technological or administrative innovation that would allow it until after really Henry VIII is able to privatize the church and take the money from that in England, that starts the process of modern nationalization. In America, because there's such a tension in between the communities and the states and the states and the nation and the communities and individuals and the individuals and communities and the nation and the state, there's so many conflicting levels of federalism, there's a lot of opposition to any centralization. Lincoln proposes it in the Gettysburg Address, really for the first time, where we see this nation. Uh, that, had not, that language had not really been used since Washington. So we're jumping forward several generations. We get to Lincoln. But even Lincoln is not a nationalist in the way that the progressives will be. But you can see a line there, and I, I tend to be very much in favor of Lincoln, but I think most of what he did in terms of nationalism 
was a temporary measure necessary to maintain the Republic. Almost every law that the Republicans and Lincoln passed during the Civil War was rescinded afterwards, except for the Secret Service Act. Otherwise, everything was taken down, every single thing. And of course, Lincoln let, you know, in his mind, everybody was to be let go without trial. That's a, a very anti-nationalist statement, just to let everybody go home. As long as they take the, on the 13th Amendment, it's all done. No trials, no punishments. But then you have people like John Wesley Powell, and you have the early progressives, who all of whom would be, have been your age during the Civil War. And they come into their manhood in a regimented society. That is, they develop their manhood in their regiment, in the military. And so it's understandable, it, I don't think it's good, but it's understandable that when they gain political power, their image is an idealized nationalist version of Lincoln and of the Union Army. If we could stop slavery as a country, we can declare a war on poverty. We can declare a war on war. We can declare a war on whatever name, you know, insert your, your equation there, insert your, uh, your variable, and you can do it. And that became the ideal, I think, of the progressive generation. Going forward, there have been debates within the conservative movement about the concept of nationalism and whether or not it is right. possible to be both a conservative and a nationalist. Um, how have American conservatives since World War II and the American conservative movement, how have they thought about the concept of nationalism and how should we right. think about nationalism in contemporary politics today? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael, and it, of course it's loaded. There's so many layers to that. In general, right after World War II, now remember, we had just fought the Nazis, right, the National Socialists. So it's pretty important to note that when American conservatism and libertarianism arose in the late 40s and early 50s, it was led by people like anarchist Albert J. Nock, quasi-anarchist Bill Buckley, a very libertarian, later conservative Russell Kirk, Fred, uh, Frank Meyer, libertarian. So a lot of the people who were involved in the formation, first of all, they tended to either be Jewish or Catholic which meant they were reluctant to be nationalists. Catholics are rarely, it's hard to find Catholic nationalists outside of Ireland and Poland. Uh, and so a lot of the nationalism that did exist in the world was seen as the enemy. And many people even argued that communism was just a form of Russian nationalism with a more kind of maybe a more humane, not, not really, but that was the propaganda. So when conservatism and libertarian arose, the greatest enemy was not just ideology, it was the nation state armed with ideology. So most conservatism and libertarianism developed as an anti-nationalist form of political thinking. So historically, it's very hard to find any American conservative or libertarian who embraced nationalism. They tended to, to find it abhorrent. And it's not, you'll always find patriotism. That's one thing. And you'll also find a lot of conservatives and libertarians are totally fine with Ireland and Polish nationalism, those are always the exceptions where nationalism was good. And also the same thing with Judaism as nationalism, with Zionism. So, you know, especially if the Israelis have to take on all of the Arabs ganging up on them, then it's perfectly fine if the Israelis bond in Zionism and nationalism. But in America, it was not seen as a good thing at all. But most people, Eric Vogelin, Ray Bradbury, George Orwell, who of course is more of a socialist, but very much a part of the movement, uh, T.S. Eliot, Evelyn Waugh, Russell Kirk, all of these people would have been adamantly and were adamantly anti-nationalist. Going forward, how do you think that anti-nationalist streak in American conservatism, how do you think that uh, it, it, it should apply itself to contemporary problems? I know that yeah. oftentimes conservative thinkers talk about um, a fractured republic, sure. and they want to sort of put the pieces back together. How, how can we do that without necessarily going yeah. into the more yeah. ideological aspects of nationalism? Great question. Uh, let, me, let me put it this way, and I'll sound pretty extreme here, but I, I think it counts, uh, at least to a certain degree. In the American Civil War, we know that 94% of all Union soldiers volunteered. You jump forward two generations to World War II, and roughly only about 11% of American soldiers volunteered. So that to me is very interesting, that you have a war where the vast majority of people are there because they believe it's the right thing to do. That doesn't mean that World War II soldiers didn't think it was the right thing to do, but they clearly weren't just signing up on day one like their grandfathers did in the Civil War. And I would go so far as to say that if you don't have a country where people are more than willing to defend that country, if you have to force it in some way, you've lost something very dramatic. That is, if you have to draft your soldiers 
your nation may already be done. Maybe not yet, maybe not tomorrow. And I don't mean to suggest it's not a good thing if, yeah, it, even if my fellow people, my fellow citizens don't believe in America anymore, maybe it's a good thing that protecting it just for my family and the sake of our kids. So don't get me wrong. But I think it's very telling that once you have a draft instituted in the 20th century, and always argued from kind of an American nationalist standpoint, to me that's very scary because it means you have no longer been able to persuade generations of what the right thing is. They now have to be forced. That's where I think nationalism is overall. The draft is one example. But I fear, so when you ask me, when you say, I think a lot of conservatives want to put the pieces back together, I'm completely with you. I just don't think the best way to do it is by the force of law, or I think it needs to be persuasion again, and it may take a generation or two. It's not an easy thing. It's not something we can solve with a law or a subsidy or a tax break. I think it's one of those things that we just have to cultivate again, and it may take a few generations to get back to it. Now, if that means we're going to end in civil war, if the country's going to rip apart in violence, then all bets are off. I mean, at that point, yeah, you know, you know, that's that's where I'm very happy. We have a Second Amendment. You know, and I think that's very important. But you know, I think a lot depends on where we go from here. We've seen how fragile the fabric of the Republic is over the last year. Yeah, we haven't seen the kind of violence we've seen at home and abroad since the 1960s. So it's a dangerous time. To what extent do you think that Donald Trump and the political movement that's coalesced around him? is a resurgence of the sort of progressive nationalism that well, you're describing. I don't think there's any question that it is. And, and of course, you know, part of the reason we talked about this is you know, we were interested in this article from National Review, from Lowry, especially for the love of country, which argues for, as they call it, a responsible nationalism. And I understand where they're coming from. And I, I, I think both of those writers are fantastic. I love NR. But I think it's a very dangerous thing to flirt with. I think that would be like us saying, I think we should flirt with communism and see, could we have a conservative communism? To me, nationalism is an ism no better than communism. Now, patriotism is fine. I think that's I think it's great we need to go back to the Declaration. That, to me, is patriotic. Looking at the Northwest Ordinance, looking at the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that, to me, and trying to understand where that comes from, that's patriotism. That's different than nationalism. For me, I have, I guess, a very, a very Burkean notion of nation, and that is, or patriotism, that is, for us to love our country, our, must, our country must be lovely. Whereas nationalism strikes me as my country right or wrong. It should be my country right at least when things are working normally. What, are, what, what do you think that some of those conservative, lumin, those anti-nationalist conservative luminaries, what do you think they would say to Rich Lowry, Rap Lowry and Ramesh Panuru today in response to their flirtations with a conservative nationalism? Well, I think, again, these are both very respected, very intelligent guys who are great writers. So I, they're making an argument that has to be discussed. I don't agree with them. I'm adamantly against what they're saying. But there's no way any conservative or libertarian can come out of 2016 and 2017 and dismiss populism and nationalism. That's just not possible. We have to come to grips with it in some way. I would guess that, you know, having read this article twice now, these guys are open to a discussion. I don't see them as throwing the gauntlet down. As I read the article, and especially rereading it this afternoon to get ready for this, I thought they're just trying to start a conversation. And I can appreciate that. I, I was also very appreciative that at the beginning they say, you know, this is not going to go over well with a lot of libertarians and conservatives. And that my, my reaction, I just immediately when I saw this, and I saw it you know, come over twi a Twitter, a Twitter before I got the article, I just cringed. I mean, my wife and I, I, both, I called down to her and I said, Deidre, you're not going to believe this. NR is defending nationalism. And we just, we both, I mean, you could hear it throughout the house. We, <laughs> it's just, it was, it was painful. Like, no, we can't go through this. Uh, but there it is, and you know, I, I've calmed down. <laughs> so, and I, I think the article has to be taken seriously. Um, I know that a lot of uh, freshmen and sophomores in their American Heritage classes, right around this time of the year, are talking sure. about the Declaration of Independence, the American founding, of Alexis yeah. de Tocqueville. And they're sort of thinking about the differences between patriotism and nationalism. Right. Um, while they're sort of exploring these ideas, do you have any advice for them on things that they should sure. read, things that they should be thinking about? Well, let me, if we want to talk about the proposition of America, let me put it this way. If we want to compare the great revolutions of the 1770s and 1780s, the American to the French, if we look at the Northwest Ordinance, uh, 
upon which this college is very much based. And of course, the whole Republican Party, 1854, comes out of a, a desire to uphold the Northwest Ordinance. The no Northwest or Ordinance, 1787, passed unanimously July 13, 1787, in New York, in Congress. It states in Article 2 that all contracts, all contracts, any agreement between two parties, unless there has been fraud, they are viable and cannot be overturned by the political system. That to me is the greatest statement of American patriotism. It's the greatest statement of the American common law and our understanding of it. So if you, Michael and I, we agree to do something, start a school, start a business, start a religion, which I would get in big trouble for with my own religion. But if we did something like that, we have every right to do it as long as we're not being violent or fraudulent. Whereas the French Declaration says all sovereignty resides in the nation. And there can be no association, no body that exists outside of it. So that, that to me is terrifying. And I think the American experience is very much, here's Lexington, here's Concord, here's South Boston, here's Boston. They want to ally with each other and beat the snot out of the British? Good luck. They should be able to do that. If they want to ally together and fight communities in the South in 1861, that's a part of the American tradition. Not necessarily the best part, but a part of the American tradition as well. But the idea that we would have a national body that says, Michael, you and I can form a business or a religion or school only if that's okay with the American people, I think that's heinous, and I think it's a very dangerous thing. That's why I'm worried. That's why I don't think there can be an American conservatism and nationalism. They just don't go together. Thank you so much for being on. Oh, my pleasure, Michael. Really appreciate Thank you that. very much. Uh, you can follow After Office Hours uh, on the Collegian Facebook and Twitter accounts, and you can also subscribe to us uh, on the Hillsdale Collegian YouTube page for videos like this and more videos like that. Uh, and you can also view videos like this at www.hillsdalecollegian.com. Thank you so much for watching.